I've seen people, they're like, I need to hire a COO. I read a book, got to hire a COO. And I'm like, you don't even have an assistant. That's Dan Martell, award-winning entrepreneur and the best-selling author of Buy Back Your Time. Get unstuck, reclaim your freedom, and build your empire. You don't need a COO. You need to learn how to work with an assistant, let alone a COO. A COO could cost you 300 grand. An assistant could cost you as little as 10,000 a year full-time if you want to go international. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Dan Martell to discuss how to calculate your buyback rate and delegate confidently, the five time assassins and how to avoid falling victim to them, and how to build a business that you don't grow to hate. Four people hired in the right sequence now gets you generating money while you're sleeping, which is the ultimate dream of every entrepreneur. Sequencing equals success. And if we follow that, it's really impossible for you to build a business that you grow to hate. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Before we begin today's episode, I want to remind you that we aren't beholden to any sponsors or run any ads on this podcast. This allows us to present all of our episodes raw and unfiltered. I'm not going to push any made-to-order meal services on you or try to save you any money on your car insurance. That being said, I have one small request. If you receive any value from this podcast, please give it a five-star review. Pay the fee so we can keep this podcast free. All right, Dan, welcome to the podcast. Michael, it is an honor. I'm super excited to be here. I'm going to give you 110%. Like The thing I want to deliver for your audience, because I have so much respect for what you've created here, is I am going to bring the energy and the creativity and the stories, all of it. It's yours. Let's start at the beginning. I am honored to have you on. Obviously, your book, Buy Back Your Time, has taken the world by storm. I mean, I've come across so many entrepreneurs that are raving about this book. I've been passing it out to like my closest colleagues. Let's just kick it off with like what what motivated you to even write the book in the first place? I wrote the book because I've been an entrepreneur for 25 years. Entrepreneurship literally saved my life. I talk about the beginning of the book. I, I grew up in an alcoholic family, ended up in getting in trouble and had a whole chaotic side to my life where I ended up in prison twice by the age of 17. And luckily through some really incredible people showing up in my life at the right times, um, I made it through this really dark period. Being better to build our business, because really that's what entrepreneurship is about. If you want your company to grow, you have to grow. And I went on this journey my whole life, my whole career of just trying to figure out like, what's my next level? How do I expand? How do I, you know, audit my behaviors, my mindset, my beliefs, my worldviews, my character traits, all these things so that I, I became more, so I had more to give so I could serve at a higher level. And then I would have people over the last 25 years, I, you know, again, super blessed to have built and exited you know, some very significant companies becoming a millionaire when I was 27 to, you know, now running a hundred million dollar fund. And I've invested, I think in 60 companies. I just wanted to take my very unique approach to time and energy. And it's very different from anything that's ever been written about before because it's based off of 1500 books I've read on productivity and leadership and company growth. I tried to write the book that I would have wanted when I was starting off. And I wrote the book for the creators out there, the entrepreneurs, because I want to teach people how to build a business they don't grow to hate. And unfortunately, that's what happens to most entrepreneurs. You know, and even though today a big part of my life is going back and talking to the kids that find themselves in the place that I found myself, and that's probably the thing I'm most proud of is just continuing to support the next generation of entrepreneurs. I wanted to write a book to help my friends do more with their companies and to Find a way to build a business that lit them up, that actually created wealth for their families. Because the truth is, is most people have these beliefs that the bigger the business gets, the harder it gets. And that doesn't have to be the case. And I proved that, I think, 
very clearly in my book using first principles in math. You can literally build an empire. And for me, an empire is a life of unlimited creation you never have to retire from. I wrote it for all the entrepreneurs out there, for my brother who's a home builder, for my wife who runs an agency, to all my best friends that run HVAC companies and sign companies. I just wanted to kind of write a process that I've been using that's blessed my life and share it with the world. So that's the movement I'm out there to create. It's just teach people how to use the buyback principle to build meaningful companies that they don't, they don't hate. And you mentioned that a lot of like your early businesses failed due to your GSD or, or, or get shit done mentality. And, and I would say that many entrepreneurs, if not most entrepreneurs are generally ambitious people that have a significant work ethic, but how did you come to realize this, a need for a different approach and, and what led to that change in mindset? Just so people understand, my license plate on one of my cars, JFDI, right? So you guys can Google to figure out what that stands for. But I love the idea that for me, one of my superpowers is hear a strategy like some of you guys will hear today and, and go and take action on it, right? Or I see a problem and I want to fix it, or there's an opportunity I'm going to pounce on it. And those, that is actually like a powerful, positive trait, but like most things, your superpower can quickly become your Achilles heel as you grow, right? That same see something, take action also undermines your team if you're doing their job. Also eats in your calendar and moves you away from doing projects or working on things that could actually progress your business if you're tied up in the minutia and minuscule that's not designed to, to build your business. What happened for me is I had to understand how time works, that, that time is the same for every person in the world. There's folks out there that have incredible output in regards to what they can get done with their time and other people struggle to have any meaningful output. So if it's not time, what is the differentiator? And I've discovered it's leverage, right? That's the equation. Time's a constant, time's leverage equals output, output's variable. And leverage really comes down to these four C's, I call them, right? And I learned this from one of my Mentor is this guy named Naval Ravikant, and it's content, right? What, what I would say is standard operating procedures is content. This podcast is content, right? Like it's got so much leverage. 10 million people could watch it or 10 people could watch it. And it does, there's no incremental cost of doing that. A lot of businesses talk about franchise prototypes or standard operating procedures. That's all content. The second C is capital, right? We all know it takes money to make money. So like, how do we leverage capital to do more? The third is code. When we think of automation, software, every business has, you know, software to run your CRM, to the billing, to, you know, workflows, automation. And today AI would be a big part of the code component of it. And then the fourth is collaboration, which is people. And like, how do we properly evaluate opportunities to buy back our time from our calendar so that we can replenish that activity with things that light us up, what I call green time or make us more money or ideally both. And I mean, I think that's the game that most entrepreneurs don't realize that they're actually playing when they start a business is when you go from like being an employee where you're trading time for money and you go to entrepreneur where you're trading money for time, right? Just through the nature of building a business, people are paying you for an outcome or widget and then you're giving them that thing for money and then you hire people to buy back your time. I mean, that's the game that every entrepreneur is playing. I just don't think that many of them understand that. And if they did, they would just play it better. And that's what the book unpacks is the process that I call the buyback loop so that you can avoid getting stuck and hitting the pain line where the more you grow your business, the more pain you're going to experience. And it's kind of like in the words of Ray Dalio, it's like, I think it's like, pain plus reflection equals progress. And you talk about hitting the pain line, which a lot of entrepreneurs sometimes don't even realize that they've hit, but this seems like the catalyst behind a lot of change, if you, if you could elaborate on that. Pain line is a point where the more you grow, the more hurt you're going to have in your life. And this is like every entrepreneur asks them, if you were to triple your business next month, what would break? Well, my calendar would break. I wouldn't be able to deliver on it. My team would hate me. My customers, my current customers would be upset. Et cetera. And it's like, perfect. Because of that, there's probably a high probability that you have opportunities, partnerships, you have an email you've been sitting on, you have potentially raising some money from a, an investment partner, whatever it is that you're dragging your feet to take action on because of this pain, right? Or you're in the pain right now and you just want it to stop. And usually at that point, 
most entrepreneurs do one of three things. I call them the three S's. They either decide to stall. I don't want to grow anymore. Is it okay if I have a business and I don't want to grow? And, and the answer is everything's okay. There's no right or wrong in the world, but you just got to ask, you got to choose your heart. For some people, working at a job is really hard. For other people, building a business is really hard. But choosing to stall, here's what I know, your customer's demand of like better, faster, cheaper is not going to go away. So are you innovating your product or services? Your team desire for progression and enhancement. So like, if you just think about like your team, if they don't feel like there's an opportunity for them to grow in that role, especially your best people, they'll leave. I, I always say this to people, the job of a leader is to have a vision that's big enough for everyone on their team's dreams and goals to fit inside of. If that's not true, then your best people will go find a team where that can be true. The other S is sell, right? Where I get this call every week from friends of mine where they're like, hey man, I think I just, I'm ready to sell. And I go, well, okay, cool. I'm not saying you can't. I, I literally had a call today with one of my cousins. He has a $5 million a year distributor company. And he's like, I think I'm ready to exit. And when I ask him, why do you want to sell? And we list the top three things. These are all things that should have been solved by now at this stage in his business if he was following the buyback principle, right? So Selling gets you to discover what your complexity ceiling is. And what I've discovered is people think, well, if I get into this other business opportunity or if I sell and I go do this, it's going to be easier. And the truth is it never is easier. You just got better. So your complexity ceiling is now visible. You know what it is. This is it. It's 5 million in revenue. It's a team of six people. And I just don't know how to manage more. Well, go do another business. You're going to hit that same ceiling, right? So like selling isn't always the answer. And then the third S is sabotage, which is unfortunately where I see entrepreneurs really miss opportunities to improve their business or grow their business or honestly buy back their time because they are afraid of the future. They sabotage their success and it's subconscious. It's not something they deliberately make a decision around. But when I you know, see people make decisions. I go, why did you decide to do that? Usually if you ask that question enough times, why, 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 you'll get to a belief of fear. Sometimes it's a fear of success. Some people are literally scared of the potential that they could create because they're afraid of that new standard, right? Some people are scared to build a million dollar company. They won't admit it. They may not even know that it's there because, well, now that I have a million dollar company, what if I don't? What if I mess it up? I can fall from a higher place. And I think that's, those are the three S's that usually people get to when they hit the pain line that the book clearly addresses and walks through a lot of the mindset blockers and the beliefs that are holding people back from buying back their time. And I know you mentioned it a few times, just the, the buyback principle. So, the, so people who are not familiar with this, when you, know, you say this throughout the book, and I listened to the audio books, I, I heard you mention numerous times of hiring not to grow the business, but to hiring to buy back your time. Can you elaborate on that and what kind of the difference in the, and almost like the mindset shift is with that approach? The big idea that I share with people is the concept of calendar over capacity. Most people, when they hire individuals to help them in their business, contractors, team members, part-time people, full-time, it doesn't matter. When you spend dollars, labor to hire somebody, most people do it to add capacity to their business, right? I've got demand now, I need help with shipping, I need help with writing more code, I need designers because I have a design agency or a PR agency or whatever. You know, I've got somebody that does fabrication, whatever it is, they're like, I've got a capacity problem. The challenge with that is you could hire people to add your capacity, but it actually doesn't make your life better. And if anything, it adds complexity. More people means more things you have to manage. And if you haven't bought back the lower value tasks to free up your time to go do the higher value stuff, then that's where you end up building a business that might have grown in top line revenue, but you actually make less profit because you hire out a sequence, right? In the book, I talk about this concept called the replacement ladder. And it's really the sequence of hires in the order that costs the least amount of money, dollars, to gain back the most amount of time like freedom to then for you as the CEO to do the activities that light you up, that make you the most money. And if you keep making your trades using the buyback principle through that lens, then it's almost impossible for you to grow the business and not enjoy the process because as you do it, you're literally buying, you're using your calendar 
as the map, as the auditing place, right? And I teach time and energy audits. Even today, you know, this week, there's one meeting in my calendar that's orange, that's not red, but it ain't green, that I now have to find a way to get out of, either hire somebody or delegate it or cancel it. Honestly, sometimes we just got to delete. The moment I do that, now my whole week is exciting. There's no aspect of my week where I'm like doing something that I want to absolutely truly enjoy and love. And that's just a really powerful place to get to. So I just really want to teach people the philosophy of we don't hire people to grow our businesses. We hire people to buy back our time. If we do the second, we get the first. But if we do the first, we don't always get the second. Sure, there's many, many people who are going to be listening to this podcast that like the idea of this, but they will say they struggle with delegation or they fear that they won't find somebody they can delegate to that can do it as well as they can. I know, I know in the book you talk about the fact that 80% done by someone else is 100% freaking awesome, which I agree with. How do you help people get over the idea that you, know, you do have to delegate uh, if, if you want to be able to buy back your time? And then also the fact that it's okay if, if they don't do it 100% as well as you do. It's the crux of, of every entrepreneur's journey, right? I remember when I didn't have any employees and I didn't follow my logic that I learned today. And I hired a programmer because I was writing code. And I was like, well, I'm busy writing code. I need to hire another programmer. All of a sudden, I'm um, really critical about this person's work, right? And they don't do it as good as me. And then I get frustrated that I have to redo the work or that like I spent the money to pay them to do it, but it wasn't done as good as I could. I could have just did it myself. I could have saved myself the time and the hiring and all these things. And logically, I can see where people get to like that makes sense. But here's what everybody needs to understand is what is the purpose of building a company, right? My gut tells me that people want to build a business so they can get to a place, ideally fairly quickly, where the business can generate revenue without them being involved in any part of the business, right? Even if you're an artist, like in the book is, I use a lot of examples of authors and, and real artists that understand how to build a production process that creates their unique output, their craft, their, their giftedness and demonstrates that to the world, but in a way that's scalable so that if you want to go on vacation, your business doesn't go to zero. I mean, my brother sells homes and one of his customer segments are doctors. A lot of his customers, when he's talking about, you know, how's things, how's life, or you take a vacation, many of the doctors say to him, well, I would love to take vacation, but the challenge is not the cost to go on vacation. It's the lost revenue if I'm not doing surgery or if I'm not doing my practice. And that's a part that I, I don't think people use in that equation. So like when, when, as soon as I realize like, oh, having somebody else write code for me, somebody else being paralegal or an assistant or whatever it is even at 80% as good as me, is buying back 100% of an hour. That trade is amazing, right? Anytime I look out through my day and I see something, even if it wasn't done to the level I would have loved to or expected it to be done, the fact that it got done by somebody else and I didn't spend an hour, I do a lot of Ironman uh, events and stuff. So like maintaining my bikes and like charging all the batteries and the devices and the Bluetooth and it doesn't connect and like, just right before we started, we had a Wi-Fi problem. We're blessed to have a house manager, Betty. And I just messaged Betty and I was like, hey, can you deal with the Wi-Fi? And she knows the protocol. Boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, we're good to go. So like even just figuring out anything that you don't do that somebody else does, it's such a gift. It's such a blessing. That mindset of, of shift of gratitude is what's missing for most people. Instead of the frustration, you should be like, wow, somebody else did this and I wasn't involved in it. So I could go work on something that is more meaningful that could actually move the business forward. I think most people just don't have enough self-worth that if they actually had that time back, that they would trust themselves to do something productive with it. And that's why they're critical of other people instead of reflecting on the fact that they got the time back so they could do something that only they could do that actually moves their dream forward. I think sometimes people get stuck on the what they're being freed up from and not so much thinking about what they're being freed up to. And on the concept of leverage, I know you mentioned that earlier. If you could briefly elaborate on the buyback rate calculation, just as like a tool for someone to determine what are the types of tasks or activities that I can delegate and, and how do I make financial sense of it? 
the thing that I was getting hung up with every time I talked to an entrepreneurial friend is they would say to me, I can't afford it. And I'm not saying you can because some people just don't charge enough for their time. If you're an entrepreneur and you make 50 grand a year, your options are pretty limited. So the way to fix that is create more value for the market, raise your prices. Buyback rate essentially looks at your income. Okay. So Every business has different levels of income to the owner. If you're small and it's just you, then it's 100% of that number. If you like look at your income being your salary, you pay yourself plus distributions. And I would also include any discretionary expenses because I know how people don't like to pay taxes. So you might have a lot of expenses gone through your business that are more personal. If you take that total amount of dollars, the distributions, the profit and your, your pay, you know, what you take as a salary, that's the annual essentially income production of your business, you take that number and you divide it by 2000 because there's about 2000 hours in the year. That's essentially what your current business is generating per hour that you work. My buyback rate is you divide that number by a quarter. So I know I'm doing math with people and they might lose a few, but so a hundred thousand a year is divided by 2000 is 50, divide that by a quarter because I want to get people a four X ROI on their time. That $12.50 doesn't sound like a lot, but think of it this way. Anything you do in your life that's not working to produce revenue, that you could have paid somebody $12.50 or less, you're literally working against yourself. I'm talking administrative tasks, follow-up, research, travel, right? Like having a person manage in my, in the book I teach whole chapter six is around how do you delegate and properly set up the infrastructure for inbox and calendar. Michael, when we scheduled this, I wasn't involved in any part of this conversation, right? As soon as I knew I wanted to collaborate with you is the team set it up, we scheduled it. And today, like my calendar doesn't have white space, but it doesn't mean that I'm working the whole time. The hours I work is what I work. And then in that there's my workouts. There's, you know, I think I have a dinner tonight. I've got some investments I'm going to go look at. And somebody else manages my time so that I can be a thousand percent present with you right now. Or when I'm with my kids, my two boys, I want to be a thousand percent present with them. I don't want to be thinking about follow-up emails and did I send this or did I book that? Just having the mentality of using your buyback rate to look at all the things, just write them all down. People could easily just write down everything that they do throughout their day and then just look at, is there anything on this list that I'm doing that could have paid somebody else or delegated or outtasked? In the world we live in, some of this stuff can be outsourced to other parts of the world for four or five dollars an hour. So you can hire full-time people dedicated to your business. We have a whole team of assistants for our executive and senior leadership teams. And I think we pay like $1,500 a month for a full-time dedicated person that's available to any person out there. Now, you need to learn the systems and the skills to be able to work with that person, but being able to buy back your time, using your buyback rate, and that using that forcing function to not spend more. See, most people go top heavy. I mean, I've seen people... Michael, they're like, I need to hire a COO. I read a book, got to hire a COO. And I'm like, you don't even have an assistant. You don't need a COO. You need to learn how to work with an assistant, let alone a COO. And they're like, oh yeah, COO could cost you 300 grand. An assistant could cost you as little as, you know, 10,000 a year full-time if you want to go international. So the buyback rate is designed to hold people to a spending labor cost so they don't get top heavy and then work really hard to become more valuable to the market, increase your income, increase your profitability so that you can increase your buyback rate. That's literally the game that I teach people how to play is how do you become more valuable? Here's the measurement. When you work and you build your company, make sure that number keeps going up. The more your buyback rate goes up, the more time you'll buy back, the more freedom you'll have to work on things that light you up that make you and your business more money kind of an awesome game to play. And it really is. And I, I would encourage anybody who has not done this, if you just try it, it feels pretty good. I mean, even if you start with something small, let's say you hire someone to clean your home every week and you're freed up from that time. And now you're able to be more present with your spouse or with your kids. And you're like, okay, this is great. I, I now see the utility of this. So in this continuing to do that, and as it expands to other areas of your business, there's there's a chapter in the book that you talk about the, the five time assassins. And, and I love this because So many entrepreneurs are just addicted to chaos, which can be a strength. It's an advantage of dealing with risk and uncertainty, but can also be a bit of a vice in that you subconsciously seek out this stuff. So would you be able to elaborate on on some of those time assassins? What I realized when I was writing this book is there are self-creating time assassins that take no money. 
right? Like my whole thing is, is, you know, there's no point in buying back your time if there's things that you could be doing right now that would just get your time back. And the first one is the staller. Okay. So the five S's to the assassins, the staller is your own sabotage. We kind of talked about that a second ago of hesitating to make decisions. See, people think not making a decision is a pause. It's not, it's actually a decision. Either you go right or you go left, but deciding not to make a decision is still a decision. So you see people, they like read the book, right? Michael, I'm, I'm assuming people hear this, this conversation and then decides they're, they're going to get the book. And they know fundamentally, hopefully after chapter six, that they're like, okay, enough's enough. I know I should have gotten an assistant. I keep putting it off. I'm worried about having people do this and making mistakes and embarrassing me, but I know enough's enough. But they'll still stall. We all know a person that to you, it's so clear what they need to do next. But to them, it's so scary that they just stall. And stalling is one of the biggest culprits of progress. And I think progress equals happiness. And people are like, well, I want to be happy. It's like, Progress equals happiness. So Staller is the biggest time assassin. The second one is the speed demon. The person, and I used to be that person, I see opportunity and I take action, right? It's what we were just talking about. Like the speed demon, if you're too quick without being strategic, then you have to unwind bad decisions because you move too quick. Decision to buy the new CRM software and then not have the time to implement it or hire a person and not properly train them and then they're not working out, so you got to fire them. Or deciding to go do something instead of the thing that you should be doing, and then both things don't get done at the right time. So that's the second one, the speed demon. The third is the supervisor. This is the person that is the micromanager. They can't let go. We talked about this, Michael, like the person that sees people doing things, and they are like, hey, do you need some help? And they're like, yeah, I'd love some help. Everybody's going to say yes. I would say yes. Somebody came to me and was like, hey, I see you digging a hole. Do you want some help? Yeah, here, help me. Here's the shovel. That would be amazing. Thank you. These supervisors get super busy with everybody else's work because they keep offering to help out. So huge time assassin there. The fourth is the saver. This is the person that literally walks over dollars to pick up pennies. You know, I had a buddy of mine once. He had a $2 million coaching company and he was ready to shut it down. He was so frustrated by having to reinvent the wheel every three months and just didn't, his customers weren't happy. And he just, but then he called me up and he's like, hey, how have you built? Because SAS Academy is one of my companies. It's the largest coaching company in the world. It's it's one of the most successful coaching companies with a thousand clients actively. He asked me, he's like, how did you do that? And I said, oh, well, I hired this guy, Simon, to help design this whole curriculum and structure. And he's like, well, is he expensive? And I said, well, not that expensive. I mean, I don't know what I spent. Maybe I got a bro deal, but let's call it 10 grand. And then he replied, he goes, well, does he have a book? I don't think he has a book, but dude, this is the guy that solved it for me. And he solved it for seven other people, you know, just hire him. And he's like, ah, uh, let me, let me do some research first. That person didn't realize that by dragging his feet through being the saver mentality, he was risking a $2 million a year business that probably profited 500,000 a year over a $10,000 investment to solve this problem. Fascinating, right? And then the fifth S is the self-medicator. And this is the one that I think some people have different self-medication habits. Could be vaping, could be drinking, could be nefarious content on the internet, could be drugs and alcohol or drugs. It could, you know what I mean? It, it doesn't matter what it is, but the idea is this. If your habit of doing some kind of self-medication is causing friction in your life or what I call emotional shrapnel, then it's a problem. Like if you're having to fix your weekend drinking habits on Monday because you said or did things that were inappropriate, that takes energy, that takes time, right? And people don't understand. If you can't celebrate without turning to food or drinking or self-medicating, it doesn't matter how much more successful you can or how much you fail, like that's just a bad place to waste time. So to me, those are the five time assassins that cost nothing to free up our time out of our calendar. So we have the space to, to become more, to give more. And I know you mentioned this earlier, if, if we could dig into it a little bit, just the replacement ladder. It's just fascinating kind of going through the rungs because I, I think a lot of times entrepreneurs going to go about this backwards, right? Like you just, you gave the example of hiring the COO before hiring the assistant. Can you go through what some of the rungs are in the replacement ladder? Yeah. So what's fun about the replacement ladder is I remember when I was working on that part of the book, I reached out to my buddy, Alex Hermosi, and I was like, Hey, people kept asking me if you're starting from zero today, what 
order would you hire people for your business? And I just like that thought experiment. This is an interesting one. Everybody's got their different origin story. Some people get it right. Some people have to fix it. If I had a blank slate and I'm following my own process and I had to design what's the sequence of hiring and what do they take off of my plate, what would I give people as an answer? And I was talking to Alex and there's only one of them that we could go back and forth, but I'll share, I'll share which one it is in a second, but I'll tell you where we start. We start at the bottom with administrative and that's usually entrepreneurs that feel stuck where they just can't grow because they don't have enough time to get the current work done. The way to get the administrative stuff off your plate is focus on two outcomes, which is your inbox and your calendar. And that sounds scary for a lot of people. And when I say inbox, I mean, 100% somebody else manages all emails that come to you. In any normal world back, you know, 50 years ago before the internet, it would be weird for somebody to walk off the street and just interrupt you in your office. Yet today, that's what inboxes have become for most CEOs. A public to-do list of other people's priorities, especially strangers, on your time. So right off the gate, the administrative person should take over processing and then sorting through. And again, I teach it in the book, all your inbox and then managing your calendar with you, right? So giving them a template for here's what my perfect week looks like. Again, another framework I teach. And then having them collaborate with you. And I just have a daily meeting every day with my assistant and we just review the calendar. It's just one of the agenda items to just make sure it's directionally accurate, the things I'm working on, the goals I have set for myself, the space I need for the different projects, the conversations I want to have, they're all in there. People are confirmed. If something cancels, replacing it with things that are high, high leverage, high value. That's level one. And that, that there will usually buy, I mean, I've had so many people, like tens of thousands of people are reading the book every month and I'm getting messages on Instagram and LinkedIn. People are like, I bought back 30 hours of my week. I can't believe it. I don't know how I was doing this before. Thank you. So that's level one. Level two is delivery. This is somebody to help you with delivering the value that you've sold to a customer. So you can call this fulfillment. You can call this customer success, you can call it whatever. But essentially, now that I am the person who's got this specialty thing that I know how to do, I want to, and I have somebody managing my inbox and my calendar, I need to now have somebody help me learn the work that we're doing. In law, that'd be the paralegal. And then that way I can start to offload some of the delivery stuff. And for me, it's all about the onboarding and the support. As soon as I sell something, I want to give that contact to somebody else to process the onboarding and collect all the information, the payments, the billing, all that stuff. I don't need to be involved in that. And then the post activity, follow-up support documents, whatever. That's level two. Level three rung on the replacement ladder is marketing. And this is where a lot of people get messed up because they start building a team, but they haven't built a marketing muscle. They don't have a system to predictably create leads for their business or demand for their business. So that's where when you buy back your time as the CEO, you should spend time documenting what are the, what's the marketing program? Like, do you have an affiliate program? Do you have a referral program? Do you have a social media process? Do you have a partnership strategy? What have you done in the past, right? And people saying, well, word of mouth, that's all we've ever done. Word of mouth can actually be amplified right? There's a process you could define for, hey, when customers get a win, I'm going to ask them for a referral. That's a system you can document that's part of your marketing program. So the third level of the rung is marketing. And this is where Alex and I kind of went back and forth where it could be sales or marketing or vice versa. But for me, I put marketing as third, then fourth is sales. And sales is this beautiful place. And the reason why is the day you hire somebody else, this is one of the things my uh, my cousin I did a call with today, he was struggling with 95% of sales go through him. So if he's on vacation, there's no sales happening in his business. And he knows how crazy that is. He just super critical. Nobody can sell like him. So I just showed him how do you break apart the different aspects of the sales process and just Start with qualification calls and emails. Just give that to somebody else. Have them ask the seven questions. If these things are true, move them onto your calendar. But other than that, you should only be doing calls that you know are high quality. But hiring somebody to take over that whole function because you've documented it and somebody else can sell for you, I call this the freedom level of the rungs because this is now the first time, if you think about it, Michael, you have somebody else generating demand, somebody else enrolling those people into your product or service, and then somebody else onboarding that customer into your business for you to just do your magic. And technically, if you're on vacation, that can still happen till you come back and you don't lose any production. 
your calendar might look a little different when you get back, but that is a beautiful place. And we're talking four hires, not 15, not 25, four people hired in the right sequence now gets you generating money while you're sleeping, which is the ultimate dream of every entrepreneur. And then the fifth level of the rungs of the replacement ladder is leadership. And I call this essentially your executive leadership team. This is when, as your business grows, you don't hire people to get them to buy back your time. You hire people to own an outcome or a department. And I think that's a big idea that people have to wrap their head around. It's how do I hire somebody to run marketing? How do I hire somebody to run sales? How do I hire somebody to own fulfillment or account management and then work through them to build out the organization below them so that I only maintain five to seven direct reports. That's my recommendation for most people. We don't ever want more than five to seven direct reports. If you've got a dozen, I know what your life looks like. I know where your head's at. It's not fun, right? And unfortunately, that's the pain line usually happens at about 1.2, 1.3 million in revenue and about 12 people. When I get the call and people and entrepreneurs are like, okay, I can't do this. I'm clearly doing it wrong. Tell me how. And I'm usually like, just get the book, follow the process, call me if you're confused. The replacement ladder clearly outlines that sequence because I think sequencing equals success. And if we follow that, it's really impossible for you to build a business that you grow to hate. And I want to almost skip to the end because I don't want to give the whole book away. I, I think this is a phenomenal book. People should absolutely invest the time in, in reading and learning from it. And, and it's interesting, we had Alex Ramosi also on the podcast and we talked about the fact that, you know, knowledge is not power. It's just really the behavior change that goes along with it. And when you talk about the buyback life, because I think sometimes entrepreneurs, generally when they start a business, many of them will say that they do so with the ultimate goal of freedom, right? And, and being able to choose how they spend their time, what they're working on, who they're working with. I mean, ultimately that becomes the goal. And you talk about basically upgrading to a purpose or mission-driven life rather than just searching for more money. Can you just elaborate on how entrepreneurs can essentially align their tasks and activities with their purpose? It's a big conversation, but the buyback life to me, and that's why I had to write about the last chapter because it really amplifies the concept that we apply in your business. And, and look, I wanted to get people real economic output. Like I want you to read the book and make money, right? If I can help people make more money that I can get them on the other stuff. I call it the chocolate broccoli. It's like the chocolate is you'll grow your business in a way that doesn't hurt and you'll make more money. Cool. Once you do that, then let's talk about the broccoli, which is what you really need, which is creating a life where it's not about you know, dark energy, proving people wrong, sticking it to the man, whatever that was that got you to start the business and and really make it about giving, right? A pole type energy or what I call a light energy. And the way I think about it is I really believe every person is on earth to do really two things. One, become the best version of themselves, what I call their 10.0 version of who they are, their greatest self. In doing that, share your process, share your transformation. You know, and this is where Alex and I, definitely align on this philosophy of share the things that you learned that changed who you are. It's only information if it changed your behavior in the same situation, right? Share that with the world. And your world could be your kids, your neighborhood, could be your, you know, your CrossFit gym, your church, your business, your team. But I just think that if we get to a place in our business where it's not necessarily about the money, but we create the space to go on the journey of personal development and growth, because our income, and Jim Rohn used to say this, your level of income will never surpass your level of personal development. Like they're correlated. So he used to say like, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And that's the beautiful part of it. But why would we want to do that? It's because the purpose is becoming more so you have more to give others, right? It doesn't mean like some people are like, oh, so now I have to become a social media influencer. No, you just have to understand that having more should be about giving more. And if that's through your nonprofit organizations, through mentorship, it, whatever that outlet is, I just think every human on earth, and I can prove it because re, every person that has a kid, when you ask them, what's the goal of your kid? And most people say, well, I want to create a different life or a better life than the one I experienced. It's like, yeah, 100% of parents will all say the same thing. So just let's make it more than just our children. Let's become the best version of ourselves and share that process and journey with the world so we can help other people. You know, some people say, become the person you needed most in your darkest days, right? Or heal yourself and then help other people heal themselves. And that's what I love about entrepreneurship. And it's been true my journey that business became the ultimate personal development program. I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't have the feedback loop of 
the business challenges to force me to look in a mirror and say, who do I need to become to get this to this next level? I want to contribute more. I want to have more. I want to be able to serve people. I want a bigger team. Who do I need? What are the habits? What are the skill sets? What are the character traits? What are the beliefs that I'm missing? So that I have that new perspective to be able to grow. And I want to do a quick sidebar because I, I know in the book you talk about the seven pillars of life, one of which being health. And this is an area that I'm extremely passionate about. But early on in my entrepreneurial career, I probably fell into the trap as many entrepreneurs do of like sacrificing my health for the, the growth and success of the business. And now we kind of, I look back in hindsight and if I could tell my younger self, I'd say, hey, really make sure to prioritize this and focus on this. I see on your social media, you're doing wide grip pull-ups and cycling and the Ironman. Like how do you essentially make sure that you're able to prioritize your health and well-being amongst the demands of running the various organizations? There's a belief that we need to come to, and trust me, Michael, every, what you just said, I made the same mistakes, right? When I started, I ended up ballooning up to about 265 pounds. I'm 6'3", so I, you know, I walk around today, 10% body fat, 218 pounds, but like I got overweight and I didn't have the level of energy that I have today, even just avoiding injury. Like I had a major accident this winter on my, uh, I have this thing called a snow bike, which is like a snowmobile and a dirt bike had a baby. And I fell off a 25 foot cliff right onto my femur. And if I wasn't doing the leg conditioning that I do for my ultra race I've got coming up and my Ironman, I would have snapped my leg. But instead I just had a massive bruise, but I didn't break my leg. I just think as an example for our families who want to be that. And, and what I've discovered a long time ago is if you are healthy, you'll have a hundred dreams and goals. But if you're not, you only have one, right? If you're in the hospital, you're not worried about emails and schedules and deals. And you're worried about just not feeling the way you feel if you're sick, right? And if we don't make room for being healthier, we'll have to deal with the illness. I mean, it's really that simple. So we call it bank, bank accounts and belt buckles. Your belt buckle doesn't go up and your bank account doesn't go down. And it's that simple. We focus on habits that make you more money. And at the same time, you're not allowed to get unhealthy in that process because we've all been there where we had success in our business and go on vacation and then feel absolutely embarrassed to take our shirt off. Why? Was that success? Is that what we really signed up for? And it doesn't have to be a this or that. It can be an and. You can have incredible energy, physicality, feel good about what you look like, and also be incredibly productive in your business if you create your calendar the way I teach. And that's why the, the seven pillars to me is just this weekly feedback loop to make sure that I'm always working on the deficits and getting better. And then as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? I think everybody here is alive to do something great with their lives. You're here for a purpose. And if it's on your heart to build that business, to create that future, allow yourself to dream. If you've had that insight in your mind, it's because you have the capability and it's in you to create. And a game changer for me is somebody that decides that they're going to do something extraordinary with their life. They're going to start where they started and be an example of possibility as they move through the world and inspire other folks through their actions. The only way to live a life that's extraordinary is to do extra out of the ordinary. So I'm always fascinated when people are like, I did this thing, like I woke up at 5 a.m. and none of my friends do that. It's like, yeah, that's the whole point. If you go to do something and it's crowded, it's not that extraordinary. But if you're doing stuff that very few people would want to do, that's a good indication that you're right on the right track. And that to me, when I look for game changers, game changers are people that show up, do the work, desire for more. They're crazy grateful for what they have, but they know that they've got more to give. And that's how they live their life from a place of inspiration and possibilities, not from a possessions and prestige point of view, but really to just be an example of what's possible in the world. So that's that's my message. I want to give a huge thank you to Dan Martell for taking the time to speak with us today. And I want to thank you, yes you, for listening to this podcast and for your commitment to growing as a leader.
If you found this episode valuable, here are three free ways that I can help you grow your law firm. Number one, download the first chapter of my book absolutely free at GameChangingAttorney.com. Number two, you can shoot me a text at 404-531-7691 and I'll answer any question that you've got for me. And finally, number three, if you can leave this podcast a five-star review, it'll help us gain access to more influential thought leaders and bring their lessons learned here to you. For more information on our interview with Dan Martell, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit legalpodcast.com.